Here's the Pat McAfee show. I want to show you, for any of you who haven't seen this, this was D'Amico Ryan's mic'd up and explaining to Christian Harris exactly how he could get the pick six that he ended up getting in the playoff game versus the Ravens versus the versus the Browns last week. You just hang right there and just play the quarterback. Mm-hmm. Play the quarterback. As soon as he snap, step in front of it, go pick. Yes, sir. Tell you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Okay, so here is that pick six. You see Christian Harris sitting right there. What the Texans did was they lined up and showed man at the snap. They rotated to zone cover two invert. And because of that, Joe Flacco thought that Christian Harris was going to be manned up on the running back. So look at the running back in the backfield and then watch what Christian Harris does. Because what all the other part of this is too, Blake Cashman was showing blitz. He dropped off into coverage. So watch Christian Harris and, and watch how little he gave a damn about anything except the route that he knew was coming. And boop. Joe Flacco to Christian Harris. Christian Harris for the touchdown. On the Pat McAfee show, Chuck Pagano, former Colts coach, uh, just talked about just just what that means to a team when you've got a coach like that. The energy, the passion, the confidence that he obviously instills in everybody, his coaching staff, the players, nothing more fulfilling as a coach to be able, in, in that deep, going back to Christian Harris, a kid out of Alabama, um, being able to show somebody, you break this stuff down hours after hour after hour after hour, and you show them, you show them, show them, and you come down to a situation, down a distance, it's fourth and two, and you've already gone through this in the meetings, right? Your third down meeting, your fourth down meeting, and said, okay, they get in this formation, and this guy's sitting right here, read the quarterback's eyes, we're going to be step right in front, and then when it happens, oh. like you got that guy for the rest of eternity. Okay, that part was cool when he said you've got that guy for the rest of eternity because it's true. That's like that's a, you're the Pied Piper at that point. You know, when you have a position coach or a, a head coach that just gives you answers to the test, and you know that's that's what Tom Brady had. Frankly, uh, like as as much as their personal relationship, who knows? But his relationship with Bill Belichick and Josh McDaniels, frankly, was that they they taught him how to get those answers to the test. And the other part about that, too, um, when Pagano talks about the energy and the passion and everything, all of that just goes back to in the in the preseason when there really wasn't a, any f- actual football to talk about. And every time D'Amico is interviewed, he, he, he would end up talking more about his philosophy, why he got into coaching and everything. He was just all about just loving it, like making a, a, an effect, having an effect on these young guys' lives. And it's just so cool to see Christian Harris because Christian Harris – Christian Harris was on his way to being a guy that didn't live up to his athletic potential. And even early this season, I was starting to worry about Christian Harris. And now it's just night and day, man. Having the right coach made all the difference in the world. And then to the team, like, honestly, like I, I'm glad the offensive players for the Texans got to see that mic'd up because – that might be something maybe some of them would have heard the story about it, but you just, you don't see it. Like that's the kind of thing that almost raises a coach to like godlike status in their eyes. And that's the kind of guy that one, one of the biggest undersold traits that a coach can have is his ability to get guys to play injured in the NFL. And if you think about various players in the Texans right now, who maybe in the past had curious injuries that kept them out uh, in, in this year, they're fighting their ass off to get, get out there every week like like D'Amico's a big part of that one more from Chuck Pagano about D'Amico Ryans he's a player's coach and he just wants to put those guys in the best position he can to be successful there's nothing more fulfilling there's nothing more rewarding yeah um so basically thanks Chuck he just reiterated everything I said really cool that you see Chuck Pagano on there by the way like Chuck Pagano it is it, I, I had fostered kind of uh, you know a healthy hatred of him as a divisional opponent coach for a long time, um, but I also know guys who have worked with him who just absolutely love him, and I think that there's there's a lot of like kind of like Chuck Pagano traits in D'Amico Ryan's, and the the balance you always have to find there is like okay you can be a players coach and that's awesome, but like what if what if discipline breaks down? I just I, I really like D'Amico's just got that feel of a guy who keeps that balance. This is, oh, let's see. Let me consult my scroll. Okay. Oh, McAfee on Slowick. This is somewhat related. 
because JJ, JJ Watt this week really went all in on pro football focus. Uh, it, it referred to as PFF at various times after this. He kind of went all in on pro football focus as, as being fraudulent. And McAfee didn't realize something about Bobby Slowick. So he brought this up after they were talking about how awesome D'Amico is. I guess Slowick, a big PFF guy, by the way. I learned that on the internet. Oh, really? Oh, Everybody know. was saying that JJ and Slowick need to sit down and talk about PFF a little bit. Slowick being a PFF guy, McAfee doesn't realize there, I'm, I'm sensing that. Bobby actually worked at PFF for two years. And I think, I think that's something a lot of owners are actually going to like because for all of the pitfalls of PFF, and I'm going to play what JJ says about him here in a second. Um, for all the pitfalls of PFF, really their grades are the biggest thing that are kind of overblown, but they're the most talked about. PFF does a lot of really good analysis of film and personnel tendencies and groupings and all that uh it's just the grades or it's it's just it's impossible to quantify a player performance the way that they think they can but bobby has that analytical background and yet still really understands the human side of things he really in a lot of ways i feel like he's got without having been a player I still feel like he has some AJ Hinch type qualities to him where he can, he can live in both worlds. He can see the business side of it. He can see the analytical side of it. But then he very much understands the human side of it. For you non-Houstonians, AJ Hinch, former uh, world series champion manager for the Astros. So here's JJ and what he had actually said on the Pat McAfee show. They come from a very high and mighty place. Like they come oh, yeah. and they speak like they know everything that there is to know about football. And they tell all these players and these coaches yeah. that they're so much smarter and that they're so much better and that they have these ways of figuring things out that are so much superior. Um, it's just as somebody who's done it and who's been in those trenches and who knows what it's like and who knows what it's like to have somebody telling you how good you're doing. I mean, I've literally sat in a meeting room with coaches and put the grades side by side from a coach's grade and from the PFF grade. I've done it. And it's not even remotely close. <laughs> um, I, I, I know I, I would bet I'm going to have to ask JJ about this next time I talk to him. Um, I would bet that Connor Barwin might be the first name that comes up and, and CJ Stroud is related to all of us too. I think what sparked it with JJ this week was that CJ Stroud had pretty much identical stats in a lot of ways to, um, uh, I can't remember which quarterback it was, damn it. Oh, to uh, Jordan Love. And yet received a lower PFF grade. And the PFF guys and everything showed exactly why. But I think this goes way back. And Connor Barwin was a guy who I, I could never figure out why PFF graded him as low as they did. They had him as like the worst outside linebacker in football. And I think really what it was is like even if they say they know what they're doing, like the PFF guys will say they know, you know, they can understand what a player is trying to do in a scheme. The way their grading system is played up, it doesn't quite account for it. Because like Connor, Connor at times would be covering tight ends one on one downfield, like down the sideline, um, in a way that very few outside linebackers like his size can do. And then other times. I think he'd be graded down on his pass rush where he was supposed to jam the tight end first. So he's jamming the tight end, then entering the rush to rush an offensive tackle. Like he's not going to get a good pass rush at that point. He's there strictly to be the contain guy or to catch the overflow, but he would get bad grades. Meanwhile, there's offensive linemen. And I know there's where JJ gets pissed off too. Cause I get pissed off as a defensive lineman. There'll be offensive linemen. And I remember this was a big deal with Dwayne Brown. Like Dwayne Brown would get lower grades than some of these guys, and I'd go and watch these other guys, and it was like they would they would always have help, and a left tackle would always have help from a tight end or a sixth offensive lineman, uh, you know, or they would just their their pass protections uh, were super super easy. They'd be chipping all that, but because that guy never messed up, he was graded as a better player than Dwayne Brown. So it's really frustrating for players to have to see like okay the media is citing all this PFF stuff. And meanwhile, like it's just not accurate at all. So but it's, it's funny because I know how JJ feels yet at the same time, a lot of NFL teams subscribe to PFF for their other data. That's actually worthwhile. So we've got, we got off on a tangent. CJ's really, really good, regardless of what, whichever PFF grades say about anything. And um, I think as far as what Chuck Pagano said, 
that's the biggest thing to feel optimistic about this weekend and how this team really outperforms expectations in a lot of ways. Um, it's not just a matter of CJ Stroud. It's not just a matter of defense. It's it's the way the defense has progressed and evolved in these last few weeks. So if I were a gambling man, I do not think for a second that nine and a half points now is the accurate spread on this game. I understand why it's there. And like if I were a traditional bookie, I would believe in that, I suppose. Um, but I also know that the arrow has gone way up on this team since CJ Stroud returned from his cushion. That includes the way the defense has been performing. Let's see. Uh, let's see. PFF grade said CJ was good though, just not in a league game. Yeah, I'm not like I'm not overly worked up about the PFF grade from this week. I didn't honestly think that was the thing that should have triggered JJ because I, I think one of the things was uh, like at least one of the things was that Brevin. I'm guessing was that Brevin Jordan had caught a short reception that ended up going along. This is again though where it like when you try to quantify things, and I would say this about QBR, anything else. When you try to quantify things with a player it gets really dangerous. It gets really, really dangerous. And we've seen this with, with the Rockets for a long time where you start chasing statistics and it doesn't always equal championships, no matter how historical the statistics are, because it, it's best when the fundamental things underlying it end up leading to those statistics instead of chasing the statistics themselves. That Brevin Jordan, that Brevin Jordan touchdown, yes, the throw was not difficult, However, like the setting up of play action and everything that goes into it, like it all builds to that. So you can you can grade an individual play and say that it's easy, but there are a lot of other quarterbacks, and I would include a young Deshaun Watson in that, that did not pay attention to detail enough to set that play up. Like it, the the table wouldn't have been set for the defensive backs and the linebackers to buy hook, line, and sinker on the play action on that the way it was with CJ and Bobby Sloak and the way they're running this offense. So likewise, I mean, it was, it's kind of like Peyton Manning when they won their Super Bowl in Denver. Yeah. He threw a lot of easy throws, but it's because he got them into those situations. You know, it was everything he did. The, the, that those easy throws wouldn't have been available to Brock Osweiler because Osweiler wouldn't have made the adjustments pre-snap and during the snap to make to get that easy throw available. So uh, I'm, I'm not too overly distraught about it.